This podcast is brought to you by Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks. If you would like to support it, go to audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris. Welcome to the Waking Up Podcast. This is Sam Harris. Today I'm speaking with Scott Reitz. Scott is a 30-year veteran of the LAPD. He worked in the elite metropolitan division and then became a member of D-Team, otherwise known as SWAT. And he finally became the lead weapons and tactics instructor for the whole metro division. So he's a supremely qualified expert on the topic of guns and the use of force, both legitimate and illegitimate. And I think you'll find his perspective on these matters quite useful. And now I bring you Scott Reitz. Okay, well, I'm here with Scott Reitz, otherwise known as Uncle Scotty, to those of us who have trained with him. Scotty, thanks for coming on the podcast. Uh, absolutely my pleasure. I can't thank you enough for having me on. Uh, listen, well, there's, there's a lot to talk about, and I, I've been thinking about how to organize this conversation. I really I have three broad areas that I want to touch on. One is just violence in general and self-defense and related topics. The other is guns and gun control. And then finally, cops and the challenges of policing. And I, I think we're, we're probably going to move back and forth between these, these areas. But um, to start, let's just talk a little bit about your background as a police officer and just why is it that you're in a position to have an opinion on these various topics? Well, I was on LAPD from 1976 until 2006. Uh, I did my probation in Wilshire Division, which was a very hot division back then. I was wheeled, which means transferred, uh, after one year in uh, the field in Wilshire. I was transferred over to Van Nuys. I worked a special problems unit there in a hive car. I was actually a heroin expert, so I developed an expertise in heroin. Uh, it wasn't too long after that that I gained entrance into Metropolitan Division, which is an elite division within the department. At the time, it had 240 men, 60 men in SWAT, which is D platoon, 60 men in B platoon, which worked primarily the Valley, Hollywood, and 60 men in C platoon, which worked downtown. So you had D platoon, B platoon, C platoon. A platoon was administrative. And I came into B platoon, worked there for a while, and then I gained entrance into SWAT. And I was in SWAT for approximately 10 years, and both as an operator and later on as an instructor. And uh, toward the end of my career, uh, left SWAT, but I stayed in Metro, and a position was created for me by the department as the primary firearms tactics instructor, not only for Metro, but it kind of morphed into all divisions for accelerated training, uh, specialized divisions such as SIS, anti-terrorism, undercover narcotics, vice, uh, what we call the follow team, internal follow team, which would follow bad corrupt cops. Uh, and in addition to that, during my years, I've ended up having the very fortunate experience of training all over the world, pretty much, all over Europe, all over the United States. I've trained SWAT teams all over, policemen from all over. Uh, I've worked with groups such as GIGN, uh, the uh, Police Nationale. Uh, I've worked with the Italian Special Forces. I work with, <laughs> just, you know, just name it. I mean, tremendous amount of people uh, had a unique opportunity working with SEAL Team 6 during the 80s, and uh, members of Delta. So what I, uh, what I kind of ended up doing uh, after all that is my wife, Brett McQueen, and I established international tactical training seminars, and this is about over 25 years ago now. So all the experience that I have learned and all the information that I've garnered over the years, we now disseminate in our classes, not only to civilians who are beginning or have never held a gun before, but all the way up to hostage rescue for SWAT teams or specialized units, such as specialized military units or um, special forces. And as of now, uh, for the last 20, almost 28 years, I've been working as a use of force expert in police tactics, communications, police procedures, the application of deadly force in federal and superior court. So I've been doing that on a constant basis. And that's quite a process. It's a real eye-opener. So I think in essence, I learned about deadly force application, police procedures, and this applies to civilians as well, even the military, and ultimately applied it. I've been in a number of shootings, and then I taught it, and now I defend it. So it's really come full circle 
So I've got 40 years now behind the gun. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I can say as someone who's trained with you uh, at this point a fair amount, you really are one of the best teachers of anything I've worked with. It's really, it's just an immense privilege to train with you. And I think people are unaware, even people who who own guns and shoot guns are unaware of just how much there is to know to shoot well. And I mean, the difference between working with someone like yourself and working with other other people who I've trained with is just night and day. So um, people should know that you really are, in addition to just having the right biography on this topic, you're just an immensely talented teacher. Thank I'm blushing, and I owe you a case of yeah. beer for that one. But <laughs> no, thank you. And, you know, I, I think one of the things that does come through in all of our classes, um, Brett, who teaches, myself, our son Jordan, kind of runs the office, but all of our instructors are uh, current LAPD SWAT, former LAPD SWAT, everybody. All of our instructors are people that have the heart in it. They're not in it necessarily for the money at all. They're in because they care, and we understand the ramifications, the implications of the improper application of deadly force. We also mm-hmm. understand all of them have been involved in shootings, multiple shootings. And we understand what it takes not only to prevail in the field uh, or within one's home, but also you have to understand how to prevail within a court system, within a judicial system. You have to be able to accurately and honestly articulate your actions. So it is a much fuller process than what Hollywood depicts. Mm, yeah. Yeah, well, so uh, before we, we get into the nitty-gritty here, I, I guess I just want to flag both for you and our listeners some uh, what I perceive to be the biases of my audience. I think I have an audience that certainly skews to the left politically. It's also an international audience. So there are many people in Europe and elsewhere who look at, uh, for instance, the level of gun violence in America and just think, what on earth is going on? You've, you people have lost your minds. You've, you've got 300 million guns on the ground and you wonder why people are getting shot, right? So, uh, and, and many people in my audience, I, I, I think, frankly, can't imagine owning a gun. They can't imagine why any civilian would ever need a gun. They think the, uh, you know, rightly so, they think we, we are living at the, the safest moment in human history and that you know, it's, it's statistically unlikely that anyone is ever going to be involved in a, a defensive use of a, a firearm if they own a gun. So that's the kind of background assumption of many listeners uh, with respect to to topics like guns and gun control. And now with policing, many people have seen the you know the very recent and very well publicized misuses of force on the part of cops. And um, you know there's the the whole Black Lives Matter campaign that started with Trayvon Martin, which wasn't a police uh, involved incident, but then continued with with Michael Brown and Eric Garner and and Walter Scott. And others, and the reason why I'm uh, I'm so eager to talk to you about this is that you know what disturbs me here, and I, we don't have to get into the details of any of those specific cases, but what disturbs me is that there's a, to my eye, quite clearly a range of police behavior and, and uses of deadly force, and on the one hand, you have just shockingly obvious failures of training. You have cops who shouldn't be cops. You have cops who are racist. You have cops who are, who belong in prison. And then all the way on the other end of the spectrum, you have totally legitimate, understandable uses of deadly force that any sane cop, black or white, would have produced, even with the benefit of hindsight. And there's a total failure on the part of most people, and certainly on the part of a campaign like Black Lives Matter, to differentiate these cases. So there's just, and and so we have a kind of identity politics and moral confusion about what's going on here. So I, I just want, we don't have to talk about specific cases unless you want to. And I think on some of these cases, there are still facts coming in. But there is undeniably this spectrum of incompetence on the one hand and unfortunate uses of deadly force that are, that are given the constraints of policing, unavoidable. So I, I guess I, let's start with the topic of what it's like to be a cop and what, I mean, what is it that people don't understand about the cop's point of view and how difficult it is to police. And while like, you know, take me through a traffic stop or start anywhere you want, but just tell me what it is it that cops confront and why is it that uh, uses of force escalate in ways that that are are kind of counterintuitive to people who have not trained in this area at all and, and certainly who have never lived as cops? Well, wonderful, wonderful question. And I think we're about to get into a really absolutely fascinating area of the application of deadly force and training. This is going to take a little bit of time. It's a very broad brushstroke, but I worked uh, the entire, when I worked on the streets, I worked on the streets never behind a desk. I've made thousands of felony observational arrests, metro, 
That's all we did is felony obs arrest. And you're constantly stopping people. You're looking for dope guns. You're looking for suspects, bad guys, gang members, and so forth. Uh, wanted criminals. I worked on some of the serial killers, uh, such as Richard Ramirez, uh, part, you know, uh, part of that task force, looking for the Night Stalker. In Van Nuys, we were out there in special problems, you know, trying to catch uh, Bianco and Bono, didn't know who they were at the time, Hillside Strangler. But aside from that, when a police officer stops anybody on the street, you're looking at a very extemporaneous event. The officer may think he knows what's going on, but I can guarantee you that at many times, especially in very confusing uh, very fluid and dynamic and tense and uncertain situations. The arrest has been made, whatever force has been applied, and we start investigating. There are always going to be permutations that are within the incident that we didn't know about at the outset. What that means is I could stop an individual in a vehicle for running a stoplight, coming to a California rolling stop where you don't quite stop. I pull him over, unbeknownst to me, this guy just knocked over, committed a 211 Bank of America, and shot four people. But the broadcast has not been issued yet. So I come walking up with the intention of issuing a citation. Next thing I know, I'm in a bloody gun battle. I can have an individual who is mentally disturbed. He's just beaten his wife. Uh, he's on narcotic. You know, he's under the influence. Um, any number of things. It's such a both a fascinating and terrifying career, all in the same moment. As you and I are sitting here right now, there are life and death struggles that are occurring in the United States between police and individuals on the street in the United States of America. As we sit here. By the time you and I have finished this podcast, there will have been probably a number of uses of forces on LAPD alone here in Los Angeles. When I was a policeman, I always expected the worst. So when I came up, I expected the gun. I looked for it and so forth. I trained to a very high standard. And when you're... Now, now just linger, linger there for a second, because that can sound like a psychological problem or a, or a kind of paranoia that is unjustified. Wait, well, can you justify that expectation? Yeah, I, that's a good point to point out the clarification. In other words, when I make a stop, I assume that it's going to go sideways. I don't approach it in that manner other than in my mind just expecting hmm. that if he were to come out, if he were to do this, and we talk about with my partners, you know, I'm going to be cover officer, you're going to be the, the uh, directing officer, you're going to be the controlling officer, you're the one that's having the conversation with the individual, issuing commands and so forth. I'm going to cover. So if I was perhaps, if, let's say I was a passenger officer, I would already bow to the side of the car and off, and you wouldn't even know it had happened so quickly. Mm -hmm. And the car hadn't come to a full stop. And then my partner's issuing all the commands. Suspects, let me see your hands, exit the vehicle, and so forth, because all we do is high-risk felony stops, and so not high-risk type stops. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we don't issue tickets in Metro. Right. We didn't. So from that standpoint, we got many, many guns. We received many guns off of suspects. And if a suspect started making a furtive move, in other words, he starts going underneath the seat, he's inside the glove box, I might draw my pistol low ready and we tell him to freeze. We get back behind cover. We get on the PA system. Now we start issuing commands. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember at one, uh, and I talk about this in my book, and we'll discuss that later, but where we made a stop, and the suspect was what we call hinky. Mm -hmm. and there were two suspects in the vehicle. And I got out and drew the pistol low ready. It's not aimed at the person, but it's a low ready. Mm -hmm. And the fingers alongside the frame, off the trigger. And I'm issuing commands. And it's a very stern manner, what we call command presence. And the suspect looked, and you can tell he was somewhat hesitant. And I said, you know, down on your knees, turn around, you know, cross your feet, hands behind your head, interlace your fingers, and so forth. And we came up and finally put both of the suspects down, handcuffed them right away. Well, the suspect had a shoulder holster on for a 45 auto. Mm. The 45 auto was laying on the seat, on the floorboard, loaded, cock lock, ready to go. Full magazine, one in the chamber, so that's eight rounds. And I always made a point when I took guns off of suspects to ask, why didn't you make a move? Why didn't you go for it? And I never forget to this day, and this would happen on a repeated basis, they said, you had me. I knew it. Mm. And there was no use of force. I didn't have to do anything other than put handcuffs on him. Now, had I walked up in a sloppy manner, had I walked up without anticipating something go, going terribly awry, the outcome could have been much different. He may have decided that this was his chance. Right. So when I'm talking about expecting the worst, it's very benign. You would never know it by looking at me. I mean, I look like a burned out hippie, you know, refugee from Woodstock wearing my Birkenstocks and so forth. And, you know, not, not, qu not quite, but yeah. uh, those of you who can't see him, not quite. But, <laughs> but you know, I just kind of surfer dude. And that, that was my persona in the street unless I realized that it was going south. And then the persona uh, we used to refer to it euphemistically in the old days as going metro, would change mm. literally in the fraction of a second. And now suddenly right. we're in a whole different realm. But that persona 
actually mitigates and avoids a use of force because you're using proper tactics to avoid the application of force. And that's the important you know, component. And that takes time. It takes mm -hmm. experience. It takes years and years of street smarts. It takes many interactions until you finally get a handle on how you yourself as a law enforcement officer are going to comport and present yourself to bad guys, whether you are stern or not. I mean, I, I could probably address a group of nuns in one room and walk over and address a group of ex-cons, and I can relate to both of them. Mm. I mean, so, so most people who have an encounter with a police officer, uh, I don't know if, if it's most, but certainly many, aren't in fact bad guys, right? So they're, they're people who, for whatever reason, have been stopped by a police officer, and they've perhaps noticed a uh, cop fairly switched on. I'm reminded of a, a story my uh, a friend of mine told, who's a you know guy like me. He's got no, um, he, you know, is objectively a not a scary looking guy, and has no history of crime. And he's just this. Um, if you need the the caricature of him, he's essentially a, a Jewish intellectual who really wouldn't scare anyone. And he got pulled over for a traffic stop and. Something he I, he was I think talking back to the cop in in some way, and probably as someone who's never trained in the use of firearms and or even self defense, never thought about these issues. Probably you know were his hands on the wheel was were his hands visible to the cop? Probably not, right? He's probably just acting like a like the innocent person he knows himself to be. And he uh, once the dialogue starts with the cop, he's outraged to be detained in this way, and he notices the cop unfasten the restraint on his holster. And he says, what, are you going to pull out your gun on me now? And, and he just becomes you know, irate. And the cop says, well, tell me, what does a bad guy look like? Right? And that completely shifted my friend's point of view. He realized, OK, there's, there's no way for the cop to know. There's you know, reasonable expectations based on what somebody looks like. But you know, if, if your hands aren't visible and you, you, know, you could have a gun behind the door, and if a cop has, doesn't have his gun out, uh, and you have yours out. Uh, he or she is already behind the curve. And so, so just walk me through that a little bit. Well, what you're looking at there is contempt of cop. Mm. <laughs> you know, and so what happens sometimes, you have, look, policemen, unfortunately, you don't know what's going on in their lives. Uh, some policemen, and I'll be very honest, shouldn't be a policeman. Mm. Absolutely should not be a policeman. There's no doubt about it. It takes a special person to be an effective police officer. Just having the badge means nothing. It's like having a Steinway. Right. You could have one, but it's just going to be gathering a lot of dust. To be an effective police officer, you really have to have compassion for the people that you're trying to serve. Now, sometimes officers don't like being challenged, and they come up, and an, somebody says, well, why did you stop me? And especially if you get the quasi-pseudo uh, attorney that knows his rights, and mm. they all seem to, um, sometimes that throws officers off a little bit. Now they become, it's well, again, contempt of cop. And that's how the police, I'm just saying, this is how mm. some police officers might perceive it. Whereas a rational police officer who's literate, well-educated, who has the background and knowledge would be able to say, look, this is why I stopped you. These are the, this is the probable cause as to why I stopped you. And I intend to do this and so forth. You're willing to cooperate and so forth. He'd be very nice, very gentle, and very soft. And the guy keeps on coming back at him, and some policemen start building up basically resistance because what they're taught is that people should follow mm. your commands, but people don't always follow your commands. With seasoning, you learn how to winnow out very quickly and very rapidly kind of who's a good guy and who's a bad guy. And this will especially be true in some place like Los Angeles. You have officers that work certain divisions, which we would call hot divisions. Mm. They're murders and stabbings. Uh, ambulance shootings, ambulance stabbings, there are fights, there's pursuits. It's just really nasty. And it, it is nonstop in one watch. And then suddenly they take that person. Now they shift them, and let's say they bring them out to beautiful, bucolic uh, Beverly Hills. Hmm. And the first thing he does, he pulls this guy over that runs at a stoplight, and the guy gets back in his face. And this officer has been used to four or five years of basically combat. Right, right. Um, it's probably not going to go well for the, you know, he's going to probably cite him for no gloves in the glove box. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he's going to find anything he can in order to issue out that ticket. And that, is that a problem? Yeah, it can be. And the selection of, of officers, when I came on in 1976, in my understanding, they had well over 2,500 applicants. I think it was like 25,000. And I came out from the University of New Mexico, drove out here, mm. and had to wait uh, over 24 hours in line at Van Nuys High School just to put an application and go back, take midterms, drive back out. For a written exam, believe it or not, with you know four-year degrees, mm -hmm. it was insane. 
they actively processed 2,500 people, if I remember correctly, and they only took 91. Mm. Almost everybody in my class had a, had a graduate degree. Had it, we're not upper graduate. We had a couple guys with masters, but most guys had four-year degrees. Right. So you're, say, you're saying it's become less selective? or? Well, that is the general consensus with people that I've talked to because they're trying to get people to come on. I think a lot of policemen, a lot of individuals now shy away from law enforcement. Uh, due to the fact of all the negative publicity, and they said, I don't want the headaches, and I can understand that to a degree. Um, the standards and who they bring on and who they don't. I've seen some wonderfully uh, gifted individuals who have tried to get on the department that, for whatever reason, were disallowed from getting on the department. One of the more humorous ones was an individual who has a law degree from Cambridge, hmm. and he, did, he wanted to become a reserve on LAPD. And he wrote, they asked him, I, apparently at one point you're supposed to write a not a dissertation, but just, you know, some type of a, a written uh, form, and just freehand. And so he wrote it, and because they didn't understand it, they thought he was illiterate. Mm. This is a guy with a law degree from Cambridge, right? and you're disallowing him from coming on because you're claiming that he doesn't understand the English language. This boggles the imagination, so that's kind of humorous you know, to a degree. I don't know what the solution is. Um, policemen, you know, receive fairly good wages, for uh, what they do, but by the same token, it's an inherently dangerous job. You don't know what's going to happen. You can. Uh, one of the shootings I worked on at the beginning of last year, the officer's first hour in the field mm -hmm. uh, in San Bernardino Sheriff's, he's been involved in a shooting. His first day, first hour in the field, he's involved in a shooting. Right. I mean, what are the odds? Wow. So that when you say worked on, this is now in your capacity as someone who's consulting on, on cases, on legal cases. Yes, defend, defending him, yes, defending him in, a, uh, in the application of deadly force in a lawsuit that goes, was called wrongful death. Right. So I, I'm defending the officer in that instance. But what you bring up is a wonderful point, and that is that policemen don't know who they're stopping. And not all policemen are going to be great. Not all policemen have good people skills. They don't have good communicative skills. They are not able to think on their feet. They mm -hmm. don't necessarily like being braced. You have a lot of policemen that are maybe perhaps a little too aggressive, too militaristic. Right. And uh, Well, I guess I, I, I was emphasizing the other side of this. And again, here we have a spectrum. But my point, I guess the lesson I drew from my, my friend's experience was that many people just don't know. Uh, they're, they're, they're so uh, fundamentally ignorant of the, the dynamics of the, the escalation of force and what cops experience with other people and how many cops either know someone or have heard of someone who just got shot in the face the moment he pulled someone over for a traffic stop. And so we have assumptions about what is a legitimate escalation of force as a civilian. Uh, I'll give you a clearer case for me. So for instance, there are people who wind up in wrestling matches with cops, right? They go hands on a cop without understanding the implications. From my point of view, as a, you know, as a martial artist and as someone, as someone who's thought about these things, from my point of view, the moment you go hands on a cop, you have totally legitimized his use of deadly force, but for the fact that he or she doesn't actually want to kill you unnecessarily and uh, will rely on some other tools, either their own hand-to-hand -hand training or their own less lethal tools to contain you. But that the issue for a cop, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that he doesn't know, first of all, he has a gun, he or she, I'll, just for simplicity, I'll keep saying he here, but he has a gun on his belt. He doesn't know what you're going to do after you knock him out or after you get him down and, and, and dominate him physically if you're stronger or bigger, or more athletic or more skilled. And he cannot afford to wrestle with you or box with you, it, it, certainly in any kind of sustained way. And certainly if there's more than one of you, he, uh, you know, it, going hands on a cop is a disaster. And he has to assume you're going for his gun at, at some level. And so people think that, that cops should be, if someone's wrestling with them, he should be wrestling with them. If the person only has a knife, well, then that doesn't le legitimize the use of a, a firearm. And people have no idea what can be done with a knife and how disastrous it is to be wrestling with someone who has a knife, even an unskilled person with a knife. So talk about just how force may escalate in surprising ways around cops. These are phenomenally great questions and subjects that you bring up. So uh, let me put it this way. An officer never knows when you're stopping somebody, you have no idea what their intent or ability is. Let's mm. lay that as a ground, groundwork, foundation. Mm. If I lose consciousness, every time a police officer is involved in an interaction with an individual, 
there's a gun on the scene. Hmm. So there's always a firearm. If I become unconscious, I have no control over myself or the safety of others around me. Okay, that's number one. Hmm. If I am, if I end up sustaining um, injuries which diminish my ability to a substantial margin, where I'm unable to defend myself or others effectively, that also endangers not only my life but those around me as well. So when you're looking at escalation of force, what you're using is what we call a, a continuum of force. The first force is my simply coming out and saying, Sam, I need you to stop right there, please. And that's just nothing more than command presence, being nice. Hmm. Now you don't. I might be a little bit sterner. Now I'm going to issue you commands. At this time, you start advancing toward me. At that point, I might take out perhaps, and let's say, for the sake of argument, you're unarmed. But you take a fighting stance. Well, I may take out the baton. I may take out the pepper spray. If I had the taser, I might take out the taser and say, you need to re really rethink this whole situation. <clears throat> so I have some other options. So we go from verbal, we have command presence, which is just being in uniform or having a badge on telling you to do something. Then we have your less, li what we call uh, non-lethal, uh, which are the basically the baton, your OC spray, oleoresin capsicum. You have the taser. You have joint locks, you have, obviously, there's bar arms and carotids, and then mm -hmm. finally you end up with deadly force. And there's uh, less lethal munitions, such as the shotgun beanbag round mm -hmm. that comes out. You'll see the lime green shotguns. Most departments have them. Uh, not fun to be hit by. It's like hit, getting hit with a baseball bat. Not, mm -hmm. not much of a party. But you have options, but you're not always able to bring those options to readily bear on a situation. Most of the, a lot of the situations, all of my shootings occurred within two seconds. Mm -hmm. In other words, from the time that, that I realized I had to apply deadly force, the instant from my, my physical application of deadly force to cessation of activities of applying that deadly force, under two seconds, very mm -hmm. fast. Mm -hmm. I don't have the luxury or latitude of scrolling through 150 options. And this is where Supreme Court law came, comes into play. And this is a fascinating subject in and of itself. When I came on the department in 1976, all states had different laws regarding the application of deadly force. And if my memory serves me correctly, at the time, you could shoot a fleeing felon. Mm. Okay. In, the, in Los Angeles, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken on this, there was a law in the books that stealing more than $7 worth of avocados was a felony. Now, this was probably drafted in the early 1800s when mm. $7 worth of avocados was a wagon load, yes? So those, those better be some good avocados. There, there's some great avocados. So let's say for the sake of argument, I'm working Wilshire. We get up oh, avocado theft, farmer's market. So I race up there. It's 115 degrees. I'm in my LAPD blue wool surge uniform. And I've just had code seven, which is eating. I don't feel like running. And I run up and the grocer's goes, he's going that way. What do you steal? Avocados. How many? $8 worth. So I drew out my pistol and shot him. Theoretically, mm -hmm. that would have been a judicious application of deadly force under the law. Now, it's ridiculous. I mean, that's an extreme example. But there were states that had different p protocols. There were departments that had different shooting policies. Now, Supreme Court finally said enough of this. And they started to come out with different standards. And one of the standards was, was basically a four-prong test. And that was initially that you looked at the nature of the crime. You looked at the nature of the intrusion this is the app by the intrusion. They're talking about the force applied toward the individual. You looked at the nature of injury sustained by the individual as a result of your application of deadly force, and then you adjudicate as to whether or not that was reasonable. It was very complicated. Nobody really got a handle on it. So two different Supreme Court decisions came out, Tennessee versus Garner in the 80s, and then the most seminal one of all is Graham versus Connor. Tennessee versus Garner, and I won't go into it. You can look it up, but ultimately officers cannot shoot a fleeing felon unless they can articulate the weight or nature of the state's interest outweighs the interest of the individual's civil rights. Mm -hmm. In other words, I've got a murderous suspect, active shooter, classic, he's running away, I can't catch him, he's got a rifle in his hand, can I put him down, shoot him in the back without, absolutely, yes, right. obviously. That's, again, one example. Then we go to Graham versus Connor, and Graham versus Connor really sets the standards, and what they say is when an officer applies any kind of force, it has to be objectively reasonable versus subjective. It has to be objectively reasonable. And this is going to be weighed in by the city attorney, district attorney, by the FBI, by Department of Justice. It's a very extensive process. When I work on these cases, there are thousands and thousands of pages in some of these cases. 
It, t- it takes forever. Walkthroughs and excuse me, all the facts and evidence, blood spray pattern analysis, trajectory. It just mm-hmm. it's on and on. It's fascinating. And ultimately, in front of a jury, whether it's in a civil action or criminal action, the jury or the court, if they decide to go with a court mandated uh, trial, is going to decide as to whether or not the officer's application of force was reasonable, objectively reasonable. And one of the things that that Chief Justice Rehnquist came out with is an opinion stating that because police situations are tense, dynamic, fluid, and uncertain, that it is unfair for individuals to apply 2020 hindsight, mm. absence the presence of an uplifted knife. Now that's a fact. That's a wonderful wording because mm. what it's saying is, look, this is this is gets into the meat of the matter. What we're talking about when you look at something on TV and some of these are bad shootings. There's shootings that I would tell you right now. Don't, I couldn't defend them, and you need to settle. Right. The officer was completely out of line. Some of them need to go to prison because they're lying. Mm. And when you're looking at these cases, what you're looking at is, is it reasonable for the officer at the time, given the facts and circumstances known to the officer at the time that the shooting transpired, his background and training? In other words, I cannot hold a rookie with two weeks in the street to the same standard I hold myself. Mm. I've got 40 years behind the gun in all the different cases, for me to apply deadly force, it's got to be off the charts. Now, for a younger officer, I might be able to say, look, he doesn't have the experience that I do. He doesn't have the technical expertise. He he certainly doesn't have the mechanical ability. He doesn't have the presence of mind or the experience to have formulated maybe a proper decision. It may not have been a great decision. Hmm. It may be mechanically impure. But according to the law, it was objectively reasonable that he applied force, whatever force that may have been, in this circumstance. And that's what throws a lot of people because why aren't, why aren't the officers in prison? Because of the jury instructions. Right. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I'd never heard that, that courts will hold officers to a different standard based on their experience in, in these cases? or, or... Well, al- Almost, yeah. Basically, each shooting is adjudicated on its own merits. Mm. So you can't say, well, because this shooting went down this way, this one should have gone down in a similar manner. It's impossible. There are too many variations and permutations in each shooting that are unique unto themselves. So when you become involved in these shootings, each shooting has to be adjudicated on its own merits. The facts in evidence, Mm. the circumstances known to the officer at the time that the shooting or use of force transpires, his background knowledge of the entire incident, as well as his training. Now, there's also one other thing, and now we get into precipitative factors. Was the officer legally justified in being where he was? Did he make the right tactical decisions? Did he employ the right communications? Did he surround? Did he request backup? Did he request less lethal? I mean, it gets really involved. It's unbelievably involved. And I get attacked with this all the time in depositions in court. Well, why didn't the officer do this? Or I may have an attorney said, well, Officer Reitz, would it have been reasonable for the officers to have done this? And I said, absolutely, but they didn't, did they? No. Could they have done this? Yes. Would that have been reasonable? Yes. And they didn't do it, did they? No. And he might do 15 of those in a row. And mm-hmm. then finally he'll look at me and say, well, why didn't they do all those? Well, because they didn't have time. Right. What about the the intuition that many uh, untrained people have? Well, why can't you just shoot the person in the leg? Mm. Okay. I, I, this And this comes back, I get jury questions all the time. Mm. Why didn't they shoot the knife out of his hand? Right. right. Why not use a baton against the guy with a knife? First of all, let's look at this. Again, this is, this is we could have days doing this. This would be mm-hmm. fascinating. Mm-hmm. But let me explain something. Let's say uh, pepper spray, OC, is an irritant. It's not an incapacitator. Okay, so it's irritant. I've been sprayed in the face by my partner when I had an altercation with a suspect because my partner was a terrible aim. <laughs> I was still able to fight. I was still able to bring the suspect under control. We look at the taser. It's not an infallible process. So sometimes the darts don't go in uh, mm-hmm. if they don't separate enough because it's a neuromuscular, basically, disruptor. And it causes the muscles to, uh, to violently, if you will, twitch, uh, contract mm-hmm. 16 times a second. It's not my, it's, mm-hmm. It'll get your mind right. Mm-hmm. But... Both of those probes have to make contact, and then the electrical conduit is between those two contacts. Uh, baton strikes don't always work because you get glancing blows and so forth. Uh, less lethal munitions from the shotgun. Sometimes guys get hit and they go, give me more. And you go, you got to be kidding me. Mm. Uh, mm. What's this guy on? And I fought suspects that have been unbelievably tough. It's, I've, it's just scary. So when you're looking at the application of deadly force, when you're looking at less lethal and people say, why didn't you shoot him? And they're like, well, if I rip your femoral artery open, and you bleed out in 20 seconds, guess what? It's a fatal. 
Mm. Uh, also, rounds, we're talking about terminal ballistics. Rounds do very interesting things in the side bodies. And I have seen rounds that have struck, I had one shooting about three years ago where the round struck the suspect's hip inboard about an inch and a half, and then it ricocheted off the hip. It basically made a 70-degree angle turn upward trajectory now because it was a slight downward angle and went through the heart, mm. uh, bottom of the heart, top of the heart, and exited out through the suspect's uh, right clavicle, and he was dead on scene, expired on scene. Well, theoretically, that's a glancing or a peripheral hit. Mm. Uh, and so shooting somebody's a uh, knife out of somebody's hands, you better be really, really good. That's damn near impossible. Um, so all these things that you see in the movies, it's Hollywood. Yeah. And officers don't have, and we'll get into training, but the officers themselves don't necessarily have the ability to make this, you know, with pinpoint accuracy when you're working with handguns and just shoot them in the leg and wound them or shoot something out of the suspect's hands. On the contrary, there are stories of, you know, shootings in elevators where, you know, 17 shots are fired and no one is hit or 100 rounds yeah. from five different officers are, are fired mm -hmm. and the, su the subject is hit twice. But perhaps we should, we should get into the standard to which most cops are trained now and just what uh, you know, any illusions uh, mm -hmm. we have about that. Yeah, well, I will put it this way. This is one thing that has irked me for years and years. Um, I recently came back from the East Coast where the department, really good department, great chief, uh, really understood. And so they had me come out and I trained their entire department in, in four sessions and uh, over a space of two weeks. And the standard of training that I train people to far exceeds the minimalistic standards that most officers are trained to. Officers are trained to what they call post standards, which are police officer standards and training. You have to get a lot of people through academies. So you have a base level of performance that an officer must qualify with a firearm, certainly go through written exams and understand this and that. Mm -hmm. So everybody wonders why are the officers, the hit rates are terrible for police. I mean, it's in the low teens, the actual numbers of hits. Far more misses in the field and actual field documented shootings than there are strikes on suspects. Mm. We have sometimes excessive amount of rounds going downrange, although there is a brand new Supreme Court decision that just came down regarding that. However, that being said, the jurors sometimes will ask in written, well, why do the officers fire so many rounds? Why are there so many officers engaged in shooting? And the analogy I like to use, and I think all your listeners can probably latch on to this, imagine if I taught you how to drive a stick-shifted Volkswagen Bug. That's what I trained you to do. Mm. Here's your little VW Beetle from the 70s, woodstocked out. And then I ship you across the ocean. I put you into a Formula One in the Le Mans 500 at night in driving rain. And you crash and burn at the first turn. And mm -hmm. you're astounded. Well, I trained you to one standard when an entirely different standard was called for in the field. And this is what happens. When you do a qualification course, by necessity, you have to have some measure of proficiency. You have to have some standards that you can go back and say, look, the officer qualified. Here's, here are the records. But it's just, it's so vast, the mechanics, and I'll just rip through a list very quickly. You're looking at all very positions, braced, unbraced, rollover prone positions, reverse positions. You're looking at shooting, firing support hand, fire, uh, firing hand only. You're looking at low-level light problems. You're looking at high-speed moving targets, knife attack targets, hostage situations, vehicles, barricaded suspects, uh, all the impediments, you know, that may be interposed between yourself and a downrange target, partial targets. You're looking at distant targets. You're looking at targets that articulate and present awkward angles and so forth. Mm. That is a lifetime of study. Yeah. Now, yeah. when you go and you stand in front of a silhouette that has clearly delineated scoring rings, I've never seen that on a suspect. I've never seen a suspect wearing a shirt with a silhouette. Mm. And I will, right now on the record, will state that the first ex-con that comes out with an LAPD silhouette tattooed all over his entire mm. body, I'll buy him a dinner at Morton's Steakhouse. Okay. Uh, I'm sure that's going to come out someday. <laughs> That's not what you get. So we train to one standard, and most qualification courses are nominal at best. And you're doing the same course. It's just when you come back six months later, uh, for 30 years on LEPD, our combat qual course remains the same. This is a standard. You're looking at budgets. You're looking at manpower, pulling all the officers out. You have 10,000 officers. How are you going to train them all? Mm. How are you going to get them qualified? So for me, it's a real double-edged sword. And the interesting thing is that the most... Uh, well, let me put it this way. The greatest watershed event an officer will ever experience and the most seminal event literally impact an entire department is the application of deadly force. Mm. And yet it traditionally throughout law enforcement 
it is that aspect, the application of deadly force, the mechanics, knowledge of the law, articulation, that is the least trained to, that the least amount of money is budgeted for. So what you've just described is certainly troubling. It, it, it's something to which we don't have much, even with the, the use of body cameras and, and, and every, this ubiquitous practice now of recording what the cops do, we don't have a ton of evidence of, of the poor performance of cops in the application of deadly force or just the, the obvious lack of training. I mean, because it's interesting, we should probably talk about the significance of video and the way in which video can even be misleading. But from a, a hand-to-hand, you know, a weaponless uh, altercation point of view, is that there's now there's so much video evidence of cops not being trained in just how to physically restrain people. So there's just some amazing videos I could show you, and I'll I think I'll put uh, one or two online when we post this podcast. I'll put them on my blog. There's some amazing video of cops uh, wrestling with suspects. Uh, you know, three cops trying to figure out how to subdue one clearly unarmed, small, I mean, literally, so one video I'll show you, this gets, these videos get circulated in the Brazilian jiu-jitsu community because people are just aghast that, you know, no one really knows at this point, you know, 20 years after the ultimate fighting championship, there are still cops who don't have sort of basic hand-to-hand skills in, 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 you know, in grappling in particular. So there was, there's this one video that, that has made the rounds and has um, commentary from Henner and Heron Gracie, who, who are great jiu-jitsu teachers. And it's, I believe, three cops, all of whom look like they're 220 pounds, trying to control an obviously drunk, much smaller, shirtless, unarmed man, shoeless man. He's in stocking feet in a McDonald's on a, on a slick floor. He's got, he's got literally no shoes. Three of them are trying to figure out how to bring him down. And they, they can't solve the problem, and they go to a taser. Ultimately, they go to a taser, and one tries to throw a front kick at him and can't do that. They, they ultimately tase this guy repeatedly, right? And it's just the most just ghastly incompetence from a martial arts point of view. And, I, and I'm, not, I'm not actually judging the cops here. I mean, the, the problem is they haven't been trained. In, in, they, don't, they haven't been given the tools they need to solve this problem. And there's another video, which perhaps you've seen, of a what becomes a wrestling match that then winds up in a, in a lethal force or at least in a shooting in a Walmart parking lot with a kind of deranged family that just attacks the cops. I think this family had been harassing employees at this Walmart and the cops come on scene and you see this all from dash cam video. And there's, you know, it's a family of like eight people, men and women. And one cop says, okay, we need to separate the, the, this group here. And they wanted to, he wanted to control them by at first separating them. But the family refused to be separated, and they just, like on cue, became like the zombie family that was going to attack the cops. And it becomes this insane, protracted, 10-minute wrestling match with it, that, where the cops use every tool on their belts, from pepper spray to batons to tasers, totally ineffectually. One has his gun wrestled away from him, and it's all on camera. And it's, you know, it looks like, honestly, from the point of view of, of a trained martial artist, and again, this is not, not to judge these specific cops, but it looked like, you know, everyone had been dosed with some sort of neurotoxic agent where they just couldn't function properly. I'll show you these videos later, but it, it, in any case, so there's a, I think, a, a reasonable understanding of what you can't do in a situation to control a, an agitated, strong, athletic person non-lethally uh, would, in many cases, dictate an escalation of force on the, mm-hmm. on the part of a cop. Well, you know, your, your wonderful points again, and this is, you know, when I worked on the streets and still now, I work out all the time. Uh, I see some policemen that I think may need to work out a little bit more, let's put it that way nicely. The first incident you alluded to, had that occurred in Krispy Kreme, the outcome might have been a lot different. Um, the bottom line is, look, I was involved in a ton of altercations as a policeman, and we did have a great tool back then, which is the bar arm, and then you could go straight into the carotid. Mm. Well, by which you mean a, a choke, like a, it's, a, it's a, a rear naked choke. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, rear naked choke, if you want to call it. We used to call them bar arm and then went into the carotid and put a lot of suspects out that way. I was choked out in the academy a number of times. Mm. You do combat wrestling back then, and guys, you know, one guy would hold you, they got your partner to choke you out, especially if you, to get your mind right, especially if you screwed up something. So it wasn't a big thing. You'd wake up, and next thing you know, you're in handcuffs, and this is what happened to suspects. But be, as a result of a few suspects dying, I don't know how many there were, but almost all of them, if I'm not mistaken, maybe speaking out of turn here, but had intoxication, like acute 
uh, acute cocaine intoxication or other deriv or other types of uh, uh, narcotics in mm -hmm. their systems at the time that this happened, or there were extenuating circumstances, medical conditions. That was taken away. And what they did is they say, we're not going to give you the bar. You can't use the barm or the carotid unless you can justify the application of deadly force. Here's a steel baton with a handle on it. Okay. <laughs> then we have Rodney King. Now, in the old days, if you go back to Rodney King, you can see the officer striking Rodney King and very ineffectual. And in the old days, you just get on him, choke him out, he'd wake up, handcuff, and that was it. End of story, no marks, no bruises. Dust him off, put him in the car, don't do that again. Mm. When you take that away and you say, okay, here are all your other use of force options. Understand a policeman has to be a priest, a father confessor, a mediator, perhaps for a paramedic to a degree, a tactics expert, a law expert, a pursuit driving expert, a crime stopping expert, and so forth. They have all these different areas that they have to be quote unquote proficient in. There's only so much time in the day and there's so much money and funding and re human resources that are allocated to the training of individuals. Now, a lot of officers take it upon themselves to seek out additional training. I did. That's why I went to other schools and so forth and learned way back when. Same thing in terms of martial arts. Some guy, you know, the department's not going to pay you to go take martial arts studies. They're not going to pay you to stay in shape necessarily. They're not going to pay you to ever, you know, to go to outside firearm schools. Many uh, departments, some will hire us, but a lot of times if an officer comes to us, he has to do it on his own budget, his own time, his own vacation time. And that's a huge expense, especially if you're a policeman and you have a family to raise. Hmm. So when you're looking at police officers, very few of them are ever involved, very, very few are ever involved in a deadly force situation. That's number one, in the span of, let's say, 20 years. Most officers, if they work the street for any period of time, are going to be involved in a physical altercation. And a lot of them are perhaps ill-equipped to do so. And there are some people out there um, in the old days, uh, ex-cons, and you've been out to the range, and you've seen that photo I have from San Quentin and those guys in the yard. These guys are all pressing like four or 500 pounds, and they're mm. huge. Mm. And they took the weights out of the California prison system, but believe it or not, those are easier guys to fight because they tired out mm. very quickly. You could mm. catch them in a foot pursuit, mm -hmm. and all you had to do was stay off them for a while, about 30 seconds into it, and then you just jump on their back. You're not going to, I mean, they're big, strong guys. Mm. They would call a con build. Now, what they practice are martial arts. They practice ground fighting. They practice MMA in prison. If they're caught, then they get put in isolation, and, and they're doing uh, strength training, endurance training. Mm. So they've actually learned, and I remember watching the first Hoist Gracie, you know, and mm -hmm. Hoist looked like kind of a, he just standing there just kind of meek and, I, I love the guy to death. I mean, yeah. I'd love to meet him. But he's just standing there, the biggest guys in the world would come up, and I'm going to clean this guy's clock, and the next thing you know, he's twisted it up like an oily snake. Yeah. <laughs> they didn't know what, no one, nobody knew what to make of it. Yeah. Um, but officers would have to do most of that stuff on their own, and a lot of officers simply aren't willing to do that. And what they do, unfortunately, I think, is they hope that that fight's ne never going to come to them. Mm. They hope that this is never going to happen, and I'm aware of some of the videos I've watched them, and you're looking at them and you go, "Come on, guys, can somebody just get somebody just get a hold of this? Is anybody in shape? Is anybody here willing to, you know, does anybody have any skill that's just mm. going to joint lock this guy up? Let's get the cuffs on him." I will say one thing, and that is some of the toughest fights, altercations I've ever had against suspects are guys that are about five foot six and weigh about 130, 140 pounds. Mm. Un Unbelievable, and some of those are females. Mm, yeah, again, this this goes on the side of a ledger that justifies what many would think to be a kind of paranoia. But you you often can't tell how formidable a person is just by looking at them. There are women who could choke both of us out, they clean our clock. You, you know, <laughs> at the same time. You know, I I, I know some of these people, so it's a. Uh, you know, the, the difference between someone truly being trained and not is is fairly extraordinary. And you also just don't know who's armed. And so and this, this goes to the significance of having firearms spread throughout our society and, and at this point literally having more guns than people. If, if I could interject one yeah. thing, Sam. Let me, let me just tell you how maybe a typical day might have gone for me working the streets in Metro, especially in the SWAT. We'll go from, let's say, Monday to Friday. And this is how every single day is different. You're subject to call-ups. You're on standby. Uh, you get up, you drive in, you work out. You shower, put on your uniform, go to roll call. You're out there doing high-risk crime suppression. You've got court. Maybe you have court. Uh, maybe the next day you had uh, initially was um, 
was scheduled to be off because you're going to go play golf, tuna fishing, or some you know surfing or something, and then you finally now you have a be there in court subpoena. Mm. Holy smoke! So you go out, you're doing crime suppression, you get to multi four arrest, felony ops arrest. Now suddenly you're doing paperwork. By the time you finally get out of paperwork, it's now three in the morning. So at three in the morning now you drive back home, you get about two hours of sleep, you come up. Now you have to be down at two ten West Temple, zero eight thirty. Be there in court, Superior Court. You go in, you wait all day, you wait all day, you wait all day in the officer's waiting room, which is uh, medieval, mm. absolutely. I don't know, is the side of marquee or something, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> and it's just hard wooden benches, no place to do anything. And up, oh, you're continued to next day. Jesus, okay, fine. I go back home. I've got two hours sleep. Go back home, sleep. All of a sudden, guess what? You're on standby tonight. We got to call it. Let's go. Boom. In other words, by the time you get to Friday, you are absolutely wasted. You're tired. Uh, you're just exhausted. You have a family to take care of. You have bills to take care of. The demands that are put on you in law enforcement, and now they have 10-hour and 12-hour shifts. In my day, it was eight hours, five days, eight hours. Mm. But now they have a 410 and a 312. But even those, you can go overtime, and you're just exhausted. And you're spending days just trying to recruit. And it becomes a lifestyle which is extremely stressful. And then at the same time, for the average patrol officer, not in a specialized unit, they can encounter the same thing over time, night after night, be there in court and preparing with DAs and trying to be sharp on the stand and then suddenly going back out. Now I have to work the field. You know, we can't give you a special or a day off because we're underdeployed, so we've got to deploy it. Jeez, okay. You go out. You get another arrest. You're overtime. Hmm. And it just goes on and on. So you have to understand policemen don't work banker's hours. And some of these kids are out there, and my heart goes out to them because they are literally, you know, in some case, they're just overloaded. Mm. And they're asked to do an incredibly complex job. And I think in some cases that we ask them to do a job that none of us would want to take on, an inherent responsibility that none of us would take on, a risk Mm. that most of us, a hazarding of ourselves to protect others. And when we finally make a decision, when we finally apply for us, a lot of policemen now perhaps go, you know, this is, I can't handle this. Because Mm. I'm trying to defend myself, I'm hazarding myself to protect you, and then you're questioning the very method, if you want to go to Jack Nicholson, a few good men, Mm. you know, that I take great umbrage at the fact that you're questioning the very manner in which I, you know, provide that protection. That's grossly over-paraphrased. But Mm. if you think about it from that term, the next time a cop stops, you don't have no, you have no idea the next time a police officer stops you. You, know, you, you don't know what's gone on. You don't know what's transpired. You don't know what he's experienced in the last two or three, four days. Right. So I think it goes back to not only officers trying to be more empathetic to law-abiding citizens, but also law-abiding citizens realizing, and I get stopped by police. You know, mm-hmm. I've done the California rolling stop, and mm-hmm. you know, I, you got to be kidding me. And they pull me over, okay, and I'm so sorry. The worst, I think the worst thing is you can do is have that contempt of cop when the policeman comes up, do you know who I am? Hmm. Bad call. Bad yeah. call. I'm an attorney. Oh, geez. Bad call. Because <laughs> already you've kind of set the tone and saying, officer, may I help you? You know, could you please tell me what I did? In other words, just respectful. Hmm. And most officers are going to ping on that level of respectability. It's when you start bracing them right at the get-go sometimes that that can be a problem. And I'm not, in no way am I exonerating all policemen. There's some policemen out there that have bad attitudes. Hmm. And I've seen it. I assume you would you would concur with this advice that no matter how bad the cop, the time to complain is after mm-hmm. this. You're done following his orders, and I mean, go to the police mm-hmm. station the next day with your lawyer and sue everybody yep. if you were mistreated. But to resist in real time against a a, a cop who is maybe overtly racist or overtly sadistic or overtly unqualified. You could conjure the worst cop on earth. The time to punish him for his incompetence is uh, the day after with your lawyer, not by the side of your car you know, at midnight, having no idea wh- how this is going to go south on you. Phenomenally good advice. And the law actually states that even if the officer's actions are illegal at the time, to a degree, you're duty-bound to to basically follow his commands, okay, other mm-hmm. than the fact if he's trying to apply, you know, obviously deadly force where that, that would be completely off the charts. But if an officer is issuing commands, you're, you're legally duty-bound to obey those commands and then address it. You have redress through the court system. You have redress through internal affairs systems and so forth. That is what I would recommend to individuals. Mm-hmm. And uh, I 
am a very, very big proponent of civil liberties, of, of people having their rights. I don't like racism. I don't like cops that are heavy handed. I don't like cops that come up and, you know, it's just really give off a bad vibe as opposed to the other ones that are proficient. Mm -hmm. And looking at officers that who have kept themselves in shape, that know what they're doing, that are sharp and everything else, and they come up and they're just real nice and easy going, unless you, as the antagonist, trips the switch, things are going to change. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's the, that's the officer that I always tried to be. All my partners were like that. All the guys in you know Metro and D-Team and so forth. All these people that I've known through the years were incredibly professional, but a lot of times you get policemen that overstep their bounds, and the best advice I could give to your audience and listeners is you can get upset, you can get angry, I, I, I've got it, but just let the situation go, offer no resistance, comply with his demands, and then address it at a future time. Mm. When we were in, uh, Brett and I were teaching a class in New Hampshire, and we were staying at a bucolic little town there outside, of, or it was actually Exeter, and I had parked with two tires in the blue striped lanes. Mm -hmm. And I'm waiting for Brett. She's going to get coffee. We're going to go down to Logan to leave. This is after a week out there. And so I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden this overweight officer comes up. He's got a belly sagging called Dunlop's disease where your <laughs> belly Dunlopped over the belt. The pistol's way down on the side. He just looked like a soup sandwich. Mm. And he starts dressing me up and down, telling me, he goes, uh, Mister, I don't know who you think we are, but we don't put up with this kind of hooliganism here in Exeter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, you got packed over here in the, in the, in the blue lines. You need to get out of here. Well, I'm going to give you a ticket if you don't move right now. Huh. And it, it, was just, it was hysterical. And he just dressed me up one side and down the other. Now, I just, yes, sir, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And the whole, mm. he has no idea who I am. Mm. He has no idea about my background, what I'm armed with or not. And it was just like, oh, my God. And Brett got in, and she tried to talk, and he said, ma'am, are you driving the car? He's driving the car. I'm not talking to you, ma'am. I was like, okay, just shut up, honey. Don't say anything. So we drove away, and it was a great laugh all the way down to Logan for three hours. It was hysterical. But, again, the guy just, he's probably in luck. He's probably a nice guy. He's not what I would, I would have described as an ideal cop. Mm. And his tactics were terrible. But I complied. And right. I didn't talk back to him. I didn't let him know I was. I didn't say anything. I just... Yes, sir. I'm so sorry. I'm so, I will never do this again. You know, it's basically, don't you ever come back to Exeter again, Mr. Reitz. You know, <laughs> I, I'm sure my picture's up on their police right. bulletin right now. That's but hilarious. it was absolutely hysterical. Uh, okay, so let's talk a little bit about guns and uh, the civilian ownership of guns and gun control. And um, I'm tempted to just start with just kind of an open-ended question for you here. Just What, what is it that people, uh, do you think... Uh, most people don't understand about firearms and what should they understand and what's, what's your general view of the, the, the current situation in the U.S. with respect to the, the ubiquity of guns and the, the justification people have or can't find for owning them? Okay. Well, great question. I think we let off kind of touching on that subject initially at the outset of this conversation. And, you know, you have, yes, the Second Amendment, the right to bear arms. You have the right to self-defense. I will tell you that from my standpoint, Having been a policeman, having worked the streets, having seen victims, having very intimate knowledge of victims, uh, in most cases, the police are never going to be there when you need them the most. So you need to start with that premise. Mm -hmm. so, so just to spell that out, a person who thinks that they don't need to think about self-defense or don't need to think about home defense in particular or don't need to think about owning a gun because they can always dial 911 and summon a police officer, why is that unrealistic? I mean, certainly, there are certainly situations in which it's potentially realistic. If you can always put a locked door between you and the problem, barricade yourself in your bedroom, uh, which understandably most people can't do. Imagine you've got kids in other bedrooms in the house and suddenly someone's in your house. Tactically speaking, that's unrealistic. But Let's just say that someone can assume that, listen, I can lock my bedroom door. It's no one's getting into my bedroom. Why on earth do I ever have to think about this? I can just dial 911. Would you acknowledge that there's, there's somebody for whom that is a realistic self-defense plan or even that seems? Well, it's pie in the sky. It's not necessarily realistic. Uh, that's the, by the time the police get there, most of these events are over. Uh, you know, police now are so inundated uh, with calls for service that Crime suppression is very low on the order. It's basically just racing from one call to another, taking reports, damage control. Mm -hmm. uh, I think a classic example, if you remember, I believe it was the doctor with his two daughters and his wife in Connecticut. Yeah. That's a classic example that, and it's tragic. 
Mm-hmm. But classic example, you have you have to understand these are two bad guys from out of nowhere. And this is what uh, I heard referred to once by a neurosurgeon as a trivial, pivotal event. And wonderful phrase. And what that means is that's where you have a number of different seemingly independent indices floating around in space. But suddenly, for no apparent reason, no logic, they all coalesce together at one point in space. Well, here you have two suspects that are kind of looking around for something to do, and they just happen to see the wife yeah. go into the bank, and then one thing led to another and another. You know, the whole police response, as I understand, was ineffective, and mm-hmm. you know, there's a lot of controversy over that. I got it. But the bottom line is, a lot of times, you're on your own. And some people say, well, I could never shoot another human being. Then fine. I understand that. One thing I tell people is imagine, and this is to me one of my worst nightmares, is having a person that's a real bad guy, and you have to understand there are bad people out there that you cannot negotiate with. Hmm. There is no negotiation with these people. You can't reason with them. There's no logic. There's no morality. There's no empathy. There's no compassion. There's nothing. We're talking about people that will kill you, people that will hurt you, people that don't care about the outcome. They don't care of the results. They don't care about the ramifications. They simply don't care. And having a person like that threatening your sons, your daughters, your wife, your loved ones, and you have no ability to counter that, that to me Mm. would be an absolute living nightmare. Well, I think, so let's just linger there for a second, because I think there is, there's skepticism among some people about whether that's even true. I mean, so for whether even such people exist, I think. I mean, yeah. uh, maybe, I, maybe oh. I'm walking this oh far back, too far to the precipice, and it's not interesting. But there are people who are skeptical about just the concept of, the concept of evil can be applied to anyone accurately. In, in some people's mind, there's always hope that you can get through to anyone. People have spent very little time thinking about just the, this, the phenomenon of what you're calling bad guys. And then there's the additional truth, which is, in fact, statistically true, that you are very unlikely to have someone like this show up at your door. It's good. This, this person's going to show up at someone's door, but it's mm-hmm. very unlikely to be yours. Uh, well, so. guess what? Go back. If, you want, if your readers want an interesting read, go pick up In Cold Blood by Truman Capote. Mm-hmm. And it's absolutely fascinating. I've read it you know, probably three or four times. And mm-hmm. it is a wonderful read. He's a brilliant writer. What you're looking at are the Clutter family in the middle of I mean, Holcomb, Nebraska, what folks right. out there call way out there. Mm. It, what, was it Kansas or Nebraska? Kansas or Nebraska, yeah. Yeah. Holcomb. Yeah. And here are Smith and Hickok, two ne'er-do-wells who are four over, drive over 460 miles, I believe. And on the erroneous assumption that there's money in a safe and there is no safe and end up killing the entire family. This is 1950s. Mm. This is literally shocked the nation back then. You're talking about the randomness of something like this happened. I'm not saying you have to be paranoid. In other words, the next time you go to the movie theater, you don't have to low crawl to the concession stand (laughs) and flashbang the popcorn machine and have your kids cover you from the rear. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about being aware of your surroundings, but understanding that bad things can happen. Uh, Brett and I live in a nice neighborhood. There have been home invasions. There have been shootings. There have been rapes. Mm. And just and random at the most inopportune of times. So the ability of somebody to defend themselves, you just don't know when it's going to come. You don't have to be paranoid, but I think you do need to be aware. And unfortunately, I think I heard a a statement once, and I wish to God I could remember who made it, but they said that they never met a liberal rape victim. Right. And that's very telling because, you know, you can have a pie in the sky. I want to be nice and soft and warm and friendly to everybody and nurturing. There are people out there that are not going to respond to that, that all they want to do is hurt you. And because we live our lives in a certain manner, we tend to ascribe our moral values and ethics unto other people. And we believe, well, why aren't you understanding what I'm saying? How, why can't you feel the empathy for me? Hmm. When those suspects raped those two girls, tied into a bed, and burned them alive. You, mm. you understand that you can't reason with all people. There's yeah. only one method of dealing with these people. And the irony is you, you, you bring up the, the Pettit case, which I happen to know a lot about. I, I wrote about it briefly in, in my book, uh, Free Will. I mean, the irony there is these were not 
particularly scary guys. I mean, they did this horrible thing, but you can find much scarier people in the annals of criminology. I mean, these guys were not uh, hardened criminals who had killed people before. Things got things escalated in, in a strange way for, for them. And I mean, one thing I would point out, just as a matter of, from the point of view of self-defense there, these people were living with their doors unlocked. The father, the, the only survivor, was woken up you know, being hit with a baseball bat Uh, because someone was actually Mm -hmm. standing in his house, uh, having gained access through an unlocked door. I mean, obviously, the first line of defense in a situation like that is not to have a house that that, that someone can easily enter silently. Absolutely agreed. Well, you know, I'm uh, I'm the host on, uh, co-host on Corrupt Crimes. I'm going to be the host on another show called It Takes a Killer. Hmm. We filmed about 28 episodes sometime this year. It'll start airing. And what it's basically, I sit down for over an hour and a half and debrief these different crimes, serial killers and murderers and rapists and all, and it's amazing, these cases that are out there. We've done like 28 different cases so far. I think mm. we've got 160 slated. Are you interviewing the perpetrator too? No, no. What I'm, uh, I'm given all the information that I present it to you mm-hmm. in my own words and so forth, and having known the case. But you know, we're talking about people that would abduct you know, women uh, from the street, from homes and so forth, take them home, rape them, beat them, mutilate them, dismember them and eat them, hmm. bury them in the backyard, and then wait for their wife to come home after working at the bank all day. I mean, <laughs> yeah. that's evil. Talk about a partitioned life, yeah. Yes, and so for all you wives out there, if you come home to make dinner and your husband says he's full, you need to be very suspect. Uh, but, I mean, some of these cases that I've come across are just beyond horrendous, and I've, I've got a pretty thick skin. I've seen a lot of stuff, and it's just, you got to be kidding me. Hmm. So are there evil people? Yeah, and the problem is you just don't know what trips somebody's switch. You don't know what causes a person to go off at any given moment, and that's the problem. And, you know, it's, it, it hurts me when, and we take this very seriously, we have a lot of very liberal people that come to our classes. Hmm. I have taught a lot of very liberal actors, actresses, TV personalities, and so forth who are the least likely that you would ever expect would want to know how to defend themselves, and yet they come to us. Mm. So the people that ask, we never talk to them, we never say who they are or anything else, but you'd be absolutely astounded. And some of these people are very much anti-gun, and yet they own guns, Mm. and they seek out training. I got it. But their stance is one thing, but they also, realistically, they realize, hey, there's there's a probability that, that I may have to defend myself before the police get here. If a police response time is five five minutes on average, and that's very fast. Mm. How much can transpire in five minutes? An entire lifetime. So why would I want anybody to be able to inflict their demands and their desires on myself and my family? If you, have, if you don't have the method or means of defending yourself, you're putting yourself at risk. And again, it's not paranoia. Mm. It's just some common sense. You know, it's like having your brakes checked, you know, so you don't go skidding around in the rain. Um, you know, keeping your windows clean on your vehicle and so forth, just so you can see, so you can observe. I mean, you're doing basically the same thing. Hmm. It's preventative maintenance, just ensuring that you and your family are safe. It doesn't mean you have to use it, but along with that, in hand is not just the mere ownership means nothing. I have a beautiful Gibson guitar, Les Paul, one of 25 made, gorgeous. I'm a guitar owner, not a guitar player. Hmm. So I'm trying, but mere possession of a firearm, it has to be in accordance and attendance with proper training from proper individuals that know what they're talking about, that are deadly force experts, that understand the ramifications of that Mm. force, which you do, in fact, apply. Yeah, I guess on that topic, I'd like to just um, get your your opinion on a few misconceptions or what strike me as misconceptions. Uh, Well, first, one, there's this notion that in order to have a firearm available to use in an emergency, you have to store it in some way that is not safe, in some way that it has to be out of and available for a kid to pick up and shoot himself or his sister with. And um, uh, so just talk about the, the safe storage of firearms, because, I, I mean, this is, you know, mm-hmm. as a, someone who's, who's trained with you and thought about this, I mean, this, this is the one thing that, that reliably infuriates me when I hear about these just and there's not there's not that many but every one is obviously a huge tragedy when you talk about just people's kids finding their loaded guns mm-hmm. and dying as a result yeah you know unfortunately uh, you know, we've had policemen whose whose uh, children have picked up pistols and shot the officer mm. 
And that was the officer's fault, not the kids, because they didn't secure it properly. Uh, look, in conjunction with owning a firearm is the responsibility of being mature about it, being responsible, paying uh, attention to detail, and having safes for the guns, safes that kids can't get into, either combination. You can bolt them down, and the kid can sit, sit there all day long with his junior safe cracking kit, and he's probably not going to get in it. Um, most of these saves probably five, six, a thousand dollars, but that's very cheap insurance policy. You can be prosecuted in some states if you leave an unsecured weapon and it's used in the commission of a crime against somebody else or causes great bodily injury and or death to another individual. Hmm. So you have to be aware of that as well. So there is a responsibility that comes with firearms ownership. Uh, we tell all of our students, you buy the gun, you need a safe. You need to keep it away from children. You need to give them an education. You don't have them go hands-on. You simply tell them if you see a gun, you leave the area, you tell an adult, you do not touch it hmm. in any way, shape, or form. And you're kind of debunking some of the mystique. Keeping it in your dresser drawer isn't going to help. Putting it in a shoebox up in the closet, kids are going to find it. God knows. Teenagers can hmm. basically disassemble an aircraft carrier for some reason. Hmm. They're able to get into the most you know, ridiculous of, of areas that you might think it is secure when in fact it's not. So you have to be responsible. In the state of California, you have to have a safe in order to buy a firearm. I absolutely agree with that. What you're trying to do is minimize, you know, every single time we have a tragedy, the result of that is there's kind of a knee-jerk reaction, and then, okay, well, now we're going to ban all these. We're going to ban these weapons. We're going to ban this type of round. We're going to ban this. We're going to ban that. Instead of just right at the outset, look, let's just be responsible about it. So if you... I feel very strongly about this. If you own a firearm, you need to be instructed by proper individuals that know their stuff. Unfortunately, the training industry, there are no requirements to be a firearms trainer. There's no vetting. Hmm. There's no licensing. There's nothing. Yeah. You could be a hairdresser and suddenly decide, I'm going to be a tactics instructor tomorrow, and you can hang up your shingle. It's, to me, is really absurd. It's, yeah. And there's some bad stuff out there and bad information given out. And, you know, we've heard, you know, some of these individuals say, well, if you shoot a guy, drag him back in, do this, alter a crime scene, and that is one of the worst advice that could ever be given. Mm. And totally, completely off base. And these are people that when you vet their background, find out they're very disingenuous. They lie out and out lie about who they are and what they've done. Mm. And it's just, it, it, you're going to find that out if you try to bring that person into court to bolster you, mm. Mm. Uh, much to your chagrin. Yeah. Well, on this point, on the on the point of firearm safety, I, I should I should just say that I mean you emphasize safety to a degree that is fairly extraordinary, and it's one of the most important things you teach. And so, I mean, and you've inculcated in me, for instance, when I'm handling a firearm, the the checking to make sure it's unloaded. I mean, let's say I'm going to dry fire a pistol. My checking to make sure it's unloaded is like a from the outside now looks like the behavior of someone with obsessive compulsive disorder. I mean, it's like a religious ritual. I check the chamber. I check the magazine well. I check the chamber again. I check the, mag the magazine well. I check the chamber again. It's like a moment in life unlike any other where you have to ensure to yourself that this gun is unloaded. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people who are squeezing off rounds in their kitchen because they're showing someone their new gun they got, I mean, that is a totally preventable Again, the, no, the numbers of fatalities due to this are not uh, that high. So when we're talking about fatalities due to, to firearms in the U.S., we're talking about murders and we're talking about suicides for the most part. We're not talking about accidents, but there are whatever it is, six, 600 or, or 1,000 accidents every year. But, but more than that. I mean, it's well, in the tens of thousands. Yeah, no, I mean, no, no. The fatalities in the tens of thousands. Oh, oh. But, but just in, ter in terms of someone's kid finding the gun and, and dying or someone thinking their gun was unloaded and, and, and dying. Those are in the hundreds. But yes, we have tens of thousands of, uh, we have, you know, now it's something like ten to 12,000 murders and something like 20,000 suicides uh, with fi firearms. And again, from the perspective outside the U.S., you know, a country like Japan, where, you know, 12 people die from handgun violence every year. So I don't actually know what the number is, but something something that low. This looks completely insane, the ambient level of gun violence we have in, the, in this society. So to, what is your view? I mean, if you could wave a magic wand and try to rectify the problem of gun violence in the context of being someone who sees a legitimate need in some cases, or even in many cases, for owning a firearm for home defense, what do you think should happen? 
in the U.S. In particular? Well, yeah, this, again, these are phenomenally great questions. And first, we have a flawless safety record for all, I mean, for all these years of training. Not one single, not one single fire's mishap in all of our training. Uh, it, it's just, it's insane. And all over different languages, you know, literally across Europe, and the United States, and so forth. I would say that, and I get this question all the time, especially from Europeans, uh, you know, the cowboys, you know, is that you, John Wayne? Mm-hmm. You know, that type of thing. And you're all cowboys. Well, America is a very unique country in that we're kind of founded on guns. You're not going to get rid of them. They're going to be here forever. There are too many, simply too many. And it's mm-hmm. not just the United States now, but the arms proliferation throughout the world is off the scale. Just look at the Middle East. And so firearms are always going to be a fact of life. Now, the responsible ownership and use of firearms is an entirely different matter. But uh, any criminal, if you can go out and get a uh, you know, quarter tea of heroin, you can go out and buy a firearm. They're out there. I don't know how you'd ever possibly realistically eliminate all firearms. Hmm. Although some people say we're just going to ban all guns. Well, so you don't think it, so there, it is not conceivable, even if there was the, the will politically or the, or the, and the financial wherewithal, a buyback program of 300 million guns. So let's, let's say we're doing $1,000 a gun. So $300 billion we're going to allocate toward buying back guns and we're going to melt them down and turn them into crosses. Uh, crosses. Is that just a non-starter or just on some level not even desirable from your point of view? It's not going to happen. And there are people that aren't going to give them up. Here's the thing. Okay, you're going to take a guns away from the law-abiding family man. But the bad guy's not going to comply with that. Now you're completely defenseless. So that's one argument that could be made on behalf of the good guys. Uh, Many of the laws out there are the only people, and it's fairly obvious it would seem, many of the people that are going to comply with the newer laws are law-abiding citizens. A bad guy isn't going to stop robbing banks, and as the French say, bank robert, Mm -hmm. isn't going to stop robbing banks simply because you have a law against robbing the bank. Mm -hmm. He's not going to stop doing that. He's a bank robber. You know, the bad guy's a bad guy. Um, So is it unrealistic that you're going to get a buyback program and everybody's going to buy into it? Absolutely. That's a complete pie in the sky. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's number one. I think more responsible is we have enough laws in the books at this point in time. From my perspective as a policeman, I don't want people who are mentally challenged, you know, that have mental issues, health issues, to have firearms. Hmm. I don't want people that are, have criminal backgrounds, domestic violence, to have access to firearms. Some are going to. We have, I don't know what's over 300 million people in the United States. You can't stop, check, and stop, gap every single measure. You can diminish it. So, so you're in favor of greater background checks? Well, look, I think the background checks, if you have people that are, and I think they were calling them straw sellers, or mm-hmm. straw, right, straw yeah. sellers, if you will, but a guy who's selling like 50, 60, 100 guns a year, and he's not providing background checks. Yeah, you know, I'm not, because look at San Bernardino, the individual that bought those weapons. I don't know if he sold them or gave them to the two shooters, but they didn't go and buy them. Yeah, they had a friend do it for them. Um, the background check. So there's obviously that circuitous route. The bottom line is, in terms of background checks, you know, if I'm selling to a family member, or a friend that I know or something, or another policeman, I don't see the necessity necessarily for that. Mm. When you have an individual who is operating out of his garage. Or just get the gun show loophole. Yeah. And I don't, and again, I am not up to speed on that at all because I don't really deal in this. So we don't sell guns at all. I purposely stayed away from that. Uh, but if you have individuals who can circumvent the system, come in and you know, purchase firearms and go out and use them in the commission of crimes or use them in you know, maybe active shooter scenarios, uh, no, obviously I'm you know, against having that individual being able to sell firearms in such a manner. So I think a background check there would be good. Now, that being said, if you have background checks, you know, one of the things is who is instituting the background checks, how many people you have allocated toward providing these, if I'm not mistaken, uh, recently somebody it was like a million guns were sold in the space of a, a month mm. here in the U.S. Mm. I think it was two million, yeah. Oh, was it? Well, how, who checks all that? I mean, you have to have somebody sitting at a computer going through each end of it. That's a tremendous amount of information. I don't know how it's done. Mm. I don't know the manner in which you're checked out. I don't know who decides who is on the no-fly list or, you know, fly list. But that's a tremendous allocation of manpower hours. Yeah. So somebody has to, who's policing it, basically? Well, just to, to back up here, 
Are you suggesting that the, the one of the justifications or the primary justification for law-abiding people to have access to guns is just the fact that with all of these guns in circulation, the bad guys will inevitably have access to guns. So if you hear a window break in the middle of the night in your house and someone's coming through it, that person in the U.S., that person almost certainly has a gun or certainly has a gun if he wants one. And this would not necessarily be true in Japan. And that is the reason why the law-abiding homeowner should have access to a firearm? Or are you saying that we should have access to it anyway? And it's, it has nothing to do with the fact that, that the bad guys, just by, by dint of accident in the U.S., can always get their hands on guns. Well, what I'm saying, you have a Second Amendment, which allows us to have firearms. Um, but, but from no, my point of view, the, second, the significance it, of the Second Amendment is just the viability of its ethics in the present. I understand the fixation on the Second Amendment from the average gun owners or, you know, the, or the gun culture point of view. Mm -hmm. But from my point of view, the, the justification for firearms is just the, the ever-present reality of what it's like to be attacked by somebody who may outweigh you, may be younger, there may be more of them than you are. I mean, mm -hmm. so, so it just... Precisely. It, it, yeah. Well, what I was saying is the, se the Second Amendment, the reason I brought that up, I was going to segue into the fact that you have the law, the Constitution, if you will, the Second Amendment and everything else. You know, nothing affects you. Right now, you and I are sitting here. We're, you know, great studio and everything else. You and I are mildly interested about meteoric impacts. But if we find out in the next 60 seconds that we've got about a 15-pound meteor that's heading straight, you know, at us and about to prank us right through the deck, you and I are going to develop an extreme obsession about meteoritic impact. Mm. In other words, it doesn't affect anybody until it affects you. So if you're the individual who can't defend themselves, if you're the individual who doesn't have that ability, I think that, that that's something that I would certainly take into mind, and that's why I believe very firmly that I haven't done anything wrongful. I'm not breaking the law. I, I ascribe to the law. You know, if the California comes out and says, you got to do this, okay, great. I want to live in California. I want to surf in the afternoons or ski at night and surf in the morning. Okay, I guess this is the price I pay. So what I'm doing is I'm realistically looking at the situation that you're never going to get rid of all the firearms. It's simply impossible. Mm. So, okay, we've got the laws. So just we have more than enough laws regarding the guns that are on the books. Just enforce them. Some of these are getting a bit silly at times, I feel. Uh, they kind of overstep and they get a little bit absurd, but okay, so be it. But again, as a policeman, I have seen the consequences of individuals. I've seen victims. And, you know, until you go into a scene where you can smell and see and slip in the stuff mm. that used to be a human being, and you can see the effects of a horrific crime that have been perpetrated on these individuals, and you can see the effects of the loved ones that are looking at this, that experience this, you don't understand. Yeah. You don't really get it. It's strange. I'm sort of of two minds about this because I can see it. I can stand outside our situation you know, domestically and see, you know, I know what it's like for someone to live in Australia or you know, Australia is a unique, interesting case because they did have a gun problem and they more or less did this buyback that seems so unrealistic here uh, in response to a mass shooting. And now they have you know, much less gun violence. But for me, the, the hard ethical case does come down to what you just described, which is to be against gun ownership, to even wish for, if you had a magic wand, to just wave it and get rid of all guns. What you're essentially guaranteeing is that you know, the single mother or even the single father or just the family who d doesn't happen to be populated by you know, professional MMA fighters, these people can be ambushed in their own home and they have no recourse but to grab a frying pan or a kitchen knife and now try their luck with someone who may have been, you know, going to a graduate school for crime, you know, someone who may have just gotten out of Lompoc or San Quentin or somewhere after 10 years of, you know, just lifting weights and, and thinking about how to harm people and at the moment of his choosing comes into somebody's home and decides to uh, victimize them, you have to be able to make the argument that in that case, these people should not have access to a tool that would allow them to, um, in some measure, equalize the situation. <laughs> I think this calculus changes the moment we have a truly 
non-lethal substitute that is a true replacement for a gun. I mean, if, if we come out with something like a super taser, which has all the defensive characteristics of a gun, but is in fact non-lethal, well, then I would argue, okay, then everyone should have the right to have a super taser, right? And, not, and then we should get rid of guns. But we don't have that. And it just so happens that, that any other weapon you are going to use a baseball bat, a chair, a frying pan, a knife, to defend yourself, still, to some degree, first of all, it doesn't give you the range of a gun, and it relies on the attributes of the person, the athleticism, the youth, the size, the strength, still, to some degree. And it's not, for, it's not by accident that you know, it's a piece of NRA propaganda to call a, the gu- a gun the equalizer, because it does, in the hands of a trained person, nullify the differences between people, you know, size, strength, athleticism. What you're, uh, what you're referring to is what we term disparity of force. And Sam Colt that came up with the Colt peacemaker being the great equalizer, mm. if, I'm not, if my history serves me correctly. I'm sure I'll get thousands of nasty letters from your <laughs> podcast fans. Like, hey, you idiot. But look, the bottom line is, yeah, I mean, we all lead productive lives. You have so many other things going on. I don't have time to go to the gym four or five hours a day. I don't have time to go to the range twice a week. I, I simply don't have that time, even despite the fact of what I do, because I'm involved in court cases, you know, work, working on our second book. You got, you know, kids in graduate school. Good. I mean, just life. Yeah. And my golf game mm-hmm. and surfing. So I don't have time to devote myself to, you know, being the best. MMA fighter out there, the best shooter and everything else. However, I do have a certain ability when I have a firearm, I've been trained properly, that I can neutralize just about 99% of all possible threats that may occur to me in a de- of a deadly force nature. So yes, the firearm does create an equalizer. You're not going to have some female who's five foot two that weighs all of 92 pounds soaking wet that's going to be able to stand up to a guy that weighs 260 pounds out of San Q that wasn't parole tagged or to, what we call toe tag parole, you know, didn't die in prison. Right. You have no idea some of the bad guys I've come across in my, and we're talking some hard, hard, hard dudes. Mm. I mean, massively hard dudes, tough people that would scare me. And they did, and you had to mm-hmm. fight them. You know, you know, you're young, you're in shape, you work out and everything else, you got a partner. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we're trained, and that's what we were doing. That was our stock and trade. Mm. But the average citizen... They're not going to have it. And the average citizen doesn't know what it's like to be involved. You know, our altercations in the street, those are life and death. We're, you're not talking about necessarily a, you know, where you tap the other guy gently in the lip. He gets a little black eye, and a little dribble of blood out of his nose. Like, okay, I give up. No, it doesn't work like that. In the real world, you lose the fight. You could die because your gun's taken away and you're subsequently shot. God knows what happens. These are, it, it's not what you see in Hollywood. And so, yeah, the weapon system firearm does, in fact, place civilians on a footing where they're able, if they're trained properly, again, to counter potential threats. In some cases, just the display of the firearm in a in the proper manner, drawing a low ready very forcefully. You see me do that in the range, and, you know, I've, I think I've demonstrated to you this is, this is what it would be like if you were against me, you know, as a bad guy, and I've done that certainly with actors. Well, mm-hmm. how would you act? And you do it, and they go, whoa, 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 holy smokes, that's cool. Well, but it's also effective. And what you're doing is you're actually, by displaying the firearm in accordance with how you comport yourself, you're actually mitigating. And the guy goes, you know what? I don't want any part of this. I'm out of here. And right. as policemen, we see that all the time. And I mentioned right at the outset of this conversation, drawing to the low ready on that guy and issuing commands, and there's the 45, and asking him later, why didn't you make a move? And he goes, well, I knew you guys had me. Hmm. You guys would have put me down like right now. I said, fashion in New York Minute. Yep. So what, what distinction would you make between owning a gun for home defense and carrying a gun in a state that allows for the civilians to get concealed carry permits. Because I, I, mm-hmm. for me, there's, there's kind of a bright line between those situations and many more factors come into play when you're thinking about carrying a gun in public and the kinds of situations you could get into as a civilian and also just the sheer fact of having millions of untrained, poorly trained civilians walking around with guns. I can't imagine that's a situation that cops look at with much enthusiasm. No, I'm I'm not in favor of, you know, I know some states, if you send in your driver's license to a background check, here's a CCW. I, I don't agree with that. I think, I think you need to go through vetted training. I think you need to understand the law. 
Um, just because you don't have a criminal background, we have people out there, uh, and I've been to some of these states before you're traveling through, and you have the guy walking into you know, a steakhouse with a rifle. Come on, yeah, give me a break. I've been carrying a gun in a concealed manner for 40 years. Never been made, nobody's ever seen it. Never been involved in an off-duty situation where I've had to apply force at all. Uh, I'm well aware of the factors. I'm certainly aware of the ramifications. The last thing I would want is to be in a movie theater with a bunch of poorly trained people and something happens and suddenly a bunch of people, they're all trained, get up and just start spraying mm. in all directions. Good God almighty. Uh, well, so, the, so then what do you say to the idea that the remedy for these active shooter situations, the, the best you know, prophylactic against mass shootings <clears throat> is to have more people armed? Well, I mean, you can see this going, from my point of view, you can see it going either way. You can see total chaos and just good Samaritans with guns getting gunned down by cops who don't know who the shooter is when they arrive on the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but you can also see a good guy with a gun being the answer for a bad guy with a gun mm -hmm. in, in the right situation. So just well, how, how do you think about that? As you rightly pointed out, you can make an uh, argument in both ways. Um, I think, again, if you have people that are carrying concealed weapons that are properly trained, that would be a good thing if you have people that aren't trained, that overreact. And now we don't have an active shooter situation, but rather somebody that's arguing or somebody hears a pop and they decide to, you know, God knows what. Okay, let me put it this way. You would not want to listen to me play the guitar. It would hurt your ears. I own the guitar, but I can't play it proficiently yet. Mm -hmm. And if, if you were to invite me to play at the Hollywood Bowl, I'd be, you know, it'd just be rotten tomato night mm -hmm. like you wouldn't believe. Well, nobody wants to hear that. In other words, it's the same thing. Just because you own a firearm, you don't have a criminal record, now you're going to go out. And most of the people, I can guarantee you that a lot of these people, if you brought them out and you've been through some of the scenarios, you've been through some of the classes where we have all the moving targets and knife attack targets, hostage targets, all the reactive armor, hmm. I put them through. They couldn't successfully complete one single evolution, let two days of it, hmm. where we do 60 or 70 different evolutions, 80 in two days. So you're learning all these different problems, you know, what we call problem-solving skill sets and so forth and upgrading your ability. And you watch this guy that went out, and he, now he's carrying a 380 auto that he's never fired before. He goes to the range, fires three rounds, never cleans it, puts it in his pocket, and he's going to walk around with this thing, and he's got a CCW. That's a person I would stay away from. I'd be watching him because he may not be nefarious, he may not be ill-intended, but he's just a complete mechanical fool when it comes to working with it. Now suddenly he shoots himself and other people. I mean, it's just it's a nightmare. If you yeah. have policemen that shoot themselves and policemen that shoot their partners erroneously, imagine when you have a populace that has no training right. that's out there. Right. So I am for the ability to carry a concealed weapon, but with the caveat that you're trained properly and that you have to go to recurring at least some kind of substantial upgrading of ability and substantial qualification, if you will, on a periodic yeah. basis. I mean, I've, I, the analogy I've drawn is to something like a, a pilot's license. I mean, something where you, there, there is a, a clear curriculum that weeds out you know, total incompetence and where you're, you're trained to a certain standard. I, I, just to go back to the kinds of training you do, I think you once told me that, that most cops don't actually have an opportunity to shoot even moving targets. Is that, is that the case? Oh, my God. Yeah, I mean, very few officers uh, will ever shoot or engage a moving target their entire career because most departments don't have that ability. And if, even if they did, they don't, they're not, they don't necessarily have people, some do, but who are capable of instructing in mm -hmm. that, to that capability. In other words, it's not only the fact you have a moving target system, but who do you have as an instructor that is giving you the briefing, how to engage, when to lead, when not to lead, all the rhythmic, all the mechanics are involved, and so forth. Hmm. So it, yeah. it's not only the training, it's who, gives, who issues the training as well. There are a lot of police departments where training, unfortunately, is by virtue of nepotism, or this is a favorite guy, or this guy's training because that's, he's always been here. I know of some firearms trainers that should not be firearms trainers by any stretch of imagination at all, hmm. in no way, shape, or form. Uh, you know, you need to be hands-on. You can't sit in a car and run a range. You have to be on top of people so you can give them training, so you can move with them, you can watch them, you can see problems that are coming down the line. So it's not only the training itself, but who's conducting the training, which is equally as important as the training itself. But yeah, most, yeah, most officers, they never get a chance to shoot, and most of the suspects are moving. Yeah. So yeah. again, it goes back to the Volkswagen bug and the Formula One. You know, <laughs> how, how do you expect an officer to engage a moving target when he's never done it? Right, and he 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 has a hard time qualifying, or qualifies to minimalistic standards. Now you got a high speed mover and low level light, and you've got a a background full of you know non engageable individuals. Mm. 
That's mm. going to be a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. It's got to be a hard time to be a cop. I can just imagine that that morale is is low, and and this this phenomenon that has now been termed the Ferguson effect, which some people dispute even exists, but I think it clearly exists in the sense that you know violent crime has gone up. It's gone up twenty percent in Los Angeles. It's gone up more in a place like Baltimore, which is where it's now as high as it was in the nineties, which was the mm -hmm. the most dangerous period in, in, in most violent time in modern history in the, in the U.S. One can doubt whether this is, this is the result of cops withdrawing and, and not policing the, the way they had. But it's just, it's got to be a difficult time to be a cop. And some of these trends are clearly desirable. I mean, I think the use of body cameras, I think the tr more transparency in, in how policing is done and the missteps of, very, uh, of cops it has to be a good thing. But the backlash against cops and the the assumption on the part of so many people that most cops are racists and sadists and uh, misapplying force, I just think it's it's a it's a very toxic time politically mm -hmm. for cops. And so I you just you know feel free to talk about that. But I just like on two sides we have two sides of this. We have the reality of how hard a job it is and how under resourced cops tend to be in terms of their training and you know even the qualifications to which they're held. And so in, in many cases, through no fault of their own, they're placed in a Formula One car that they have not been prepared to drive. Of course, there are obviously other cops who are very well trained and part of elite units to which that description doesn't apply. But then on the other hand, you have fairly nefarious things where you have kind of endemic racism in certain departments or you have the, you know, the, the blue wall of silence where you have cops covering for cops who obviously performed badly and even unethically. I see where we've been talking for almost two hours now. So just as we head toward a conclusion here, give me your sense of just the state of policing and uh, you know what needs to be done. Well, if you look at LAPD, and especially Metro Vision, when I was there, it was like the UN with guns. So if somebody said, well, you know, we're not looking at 1930s, 1940s, where you had to be basically, I think most of them, officers were over six feet, male, white, Caucasian, so forth. Uh, all my training officers were African-American in Wilshire Division, you know, with the exception of one. Everybody, all African-Americans. So it was a fascinating experience for me because I've been living on Navy bases my entire life. Grew up in a Naval, you know, captain's, uh, Navy captain's family and richly steeped in Naval mm. tradition. Never came across a bad book guy in my life. So I really learned, uh, I got the perspective of the African-American. And these officers themselves, even though they were on LEP, they were my training officers, have been subjected to racism. But I think that's kind of gone away, or at least I've seen that go away over the years. Uh, Metropolitan Division, where I was in for over 26 years, it literally was like the UN. You name mm -hmm. it, we got it. Mm -hmm. And they all had guns. So I'm, from my experience in LAPD, I don't see it like that. Now, perhaps on smaller departments, different departments across the United States, you can certainly, I could see where there could be a problem. Uh, I, we've all certainly seen it. But, but the LAPD did have the famous rampart issues. And, well, and... what you're looking at there are just dirty, corrupt officers. Mm. Had nothing to do with racism, so forth. You know that I could see. Mm. Now I never experienced that. Um, I didn't see that. Those are just dirty officers. They were corrupt cops. In fact, I worked on the uh, that the the Gaines shooting where Frank Gaines was a dirty policeman and he was shot and killed by or Frank Liga shot and killed uh, Gaines, who was a, a police officer off duty working for Suge Knight. It was a mm. famous shooting. I was the use of force expert on that, defending the department. Um, in terms of police officers coming on now, uh, I, I think it's a really hard time. Uh, you know, they're going to, uh, where uh, LAPD is now instituting the body cameras. Body cameras do give you one angle. They certainly represent things. Uh, they give you at least some dimension of what occurred or what transpired in any given encounter. But that's not necessarily the whole picture because mm -hmm. we don't know all the background, all the precipitatory factors that went into it, all the calls that were generated, all the different indices and facts and evidence that were known to the officer at the time he gets involved in something. Mm. So you're seeing, you know, kind of a one-dimensional, but it's good in, in some of those. There's police, policemen out there that shouldn't be policemen. Absolutely agree. There are departments that need to be restructured. I, could abs I would absolutely agree. If you show me the empirical data and evidence where these guys are doing it, absolutely. But I think most policemen now are really trying to get, do a good job. I think most of these police officers out there are overwhelmed with the demands placed on them. I mm -hmm. want you to hazard your life, but I want you to be really careful in defending yourself. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, this is my stock and trade when I go to court. It's hard because people say, well, if he uses a baton, you should. No, we're not required to. We're required to 
neutralize a suspect's actions. By law, we're allowed to apply that force necessary to bring to take a suspect and bring him into control, whether that's verbalization or all the way up to the application of deadly force. That's a hard, hard line to walk correctly, mm-hmm. and it's becoming harder all the time. And I think most police departments are probably having a hard time recruiting policemen uh, now, and a lot of policemen are disillusioned. I've, I've talked to some. I had a great run at my career. It was phenomenal. I mean, the stuff I got to do and the times I had were unparalleled. But that era will never repeat itself. Mm-hmm. It's gone. And every shooting I was involved in, I went through the same thing. You're brought out. I had to you know, go through all the interviews. We had all the documentation. There's a use of force review board. It, it, I went through all these processes just like these kids are today. So every one, every single one, perfectly clean shooting, above boards, no lawsuits whatsoever. Mm. Never was sued in my entire career, but I applied force a lot of times, bringing suspects under control. But you're looking at a different era. You're looking at a younger generation. Uh, the life experience that I had, I grew up in the 50s and 60s, and that's when you were allowed to play with lawn darts in your pe- mm-hmm. you know, My parents let me go surfing in New England in the winter. It's like they're trying to get rid of me. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, Nowadays, we, we've nerfed our kids to such an extent that now you take these kids that have been nerfed their whole life, perhaps, and I'm just saying maybe, mm-hmm. And living in their mom's basement, now suddenly as a policeman, your life experience isn't necessarily behind you like it used to be back in the 40s and 50s, 60s, perhaps mm. even 70s, 80s, I don't know. So it's, a, it's an interesting dynamic. It's an interesting time. Uh, I know one thing that I'm very committed, <clears throat> you know, we are uh, providing training to police departments, to police officers, to civilians. That's our passion. If I didn't care about it, I would stop doing it. I would mm. simply go out and play, play golf, play 18 holes and surf every single day. Right, and work on that guitar. Well, yeah. Your guitar trying, yeah. playing's bothering me. I haven't even heard it. <laughs> I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, listen, Scotty, this has really been a rich conversation, and, and it's rare for people to uh, hear such informed point of view on, on these topics. So thank you for sharing it with us. Is there anything else you want to talk about? I mean, one, one thing I want to ask you is just when people want more information about you or training with you, where should they go online? Well, you can go to uh, internationaltactical.com. We have a book out, if you have not read it, but called uh, The Art of Modern Gunfighting. Hmm. And uh, I think it's, I worked over, what, two years on it, two and a half years. Volume two is ho- hopefully, right now, ostensibly going to come out in the spring with mm-hmm. our three volumes to the pistol alone. But I talk about shootings. I talk about many of the things we've talked about today, about mindset, about bad guys, about deadly force, safety. So I would urge uh, your readers, if they own a firearm, to pick the book up and read it. I put a lot of work into it. Yeah, yeah, and it's a, I can say it's a great book. I'll put a link both to the book and to your website on my blog where this podcast will be embedded, so that, that should be easy to find. Anything else? Did we? Is there something we haven't covered that you think we should cover? No, I, cover? I, think, I think this is, I would love to return at the future. You know, if you have enough questions, um, maybe come back in the future and hit different topics, terrorism and so forth. I've worked with a lot of the folks that experienced it over there uh, in Europe, but I, I can't thank you enough. Uh, always, I have the greatest respect for you. Your writing is phenomenal. Uh, oh, I, thank you. No, it's, it's, it's way above what I can do. Is this a backhanded compliment? Are you saying it's better than my shooting? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, just gonna, I'm not going to lie. No, yeah. yes. <laughs> no, no, your shooting's fine. No, the, yeah. the, your writing is wonderful, and I, I thank you so much well, for the opportunity you. to be here. I, I enjoy you, and uh, you know, you're one of, uh, as Hemingway would say, smooth people. Nice, nice. Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, to be continued, Yeah, because there's, obviously these issues are not going away, so there'll be more to talk about. Absolutely. Well, thank Absolutely. you, Scotty. Thank you so much, Sam. If you enjoyed this podcast, there are several ways you can support it. You can leave reviews on iTunes or Stitcher or wherever you happen to listen to it. You can share it on social media with your friends. You can discuss it on your own blog or podcast. Or you can support it directly. And there are two ways you can do this. You can leave a donation through my website at samharris.org forward slash donate. Or you can try a membership at Audible, the world's leading source of audiobooks, at audibletrial.com forward slash Sam Harris.